Now, performances, sometimes we think they really exist at the moment that we come in to watch a, a play or a concert and so on. And here I'm going to use the aesthetic genres as my primary example, but then I'm going to try to help you understand it in relationship to a social drama or a social performance as well. So there are three basic uh, phases. There's what happens before the performance, there's what happens during the performance, there's what happens after the performance. Now these can be mapped onto Turner, Turner's, uh, you know, uh, uh, separation, a liminal phase or liminoid phase and reintegration. They can also be mapped onto Aristotle's famous beginning, middle and end. But for me, what happens uh, uh, before the performance is like a training and workshop and rehearsals. So training is where you acquire the basic skills, the basic toolkit that you're going to use that really is already known. Training is where you take things that are already known, that are given to you by a master teacher, and you make them part of your body. Workshop is that phase where you take the training and you also devise new stuff where you can explore. Workshop is a place to take things apart, to go further into what you want, and to develop a particular toolkit that you might use for a particular kind of performance. So training is more generalized. We can all get vocal training, we can get body training, we can do kung fu, etc., etc. But then when we go into workshop, we may want to see how does kung fu and opera singing work together? How can we play with them together? How can we uh, find new things to do? Then rehearsals are the taking of these two toolkits, that which we've acquired in training and that which we've invented or devised through workshop and applying them to a specific problem, the staging of a specific set of behaviors, the staging of a specific text, the staging of a specific space or occasion, because all of these things can be the core starting place of a performance. So rehearsal is where we move f uh, from a large range of possibilities to exactly what we're going to show to a public. And uh, let's use that in terms of uh, social performance. I'll jump a little bit in advance here. So let's say we're going to a, I'm going to a dinner party. You're going to a dinner party. So the training would be whatever you've learned about uh, courtesy and behavior and etiquette, because this is a fancy dinner party. The workshop will be as you're standing in front of your mirror or you're at home and you say, well, I think I'll use this kind of makeup instead of that kind. Or maybe when I go to this party, I, I will uh, want to offend people and I'll put peas on my fork with my knife or whatever. I can begin to play with this training, either to uh, transgress it or to obey it. Then rehearsal is when I actually get dressed. I actually put on the tie or the dress I'm going to wear. I actually begin to th rehearse how am I going to greet the first person I meet? How am I going to enter the room, etc., etc., etc. All right, so all of these things, whether they're in social performance or in aesthetic performance, uh, constitute the opening, opening phase. And of course, what I've just said about a, a personal social performance can also be applied to a politician preparing an athlete, uh, getting trained, and then uh, doing practice during the week, and then that practice becomes more and more rehearsals for the actual thing. It can be applied across this very broad range of performing that I talked about earlier then act, the actual moment of performance also consists of three phases, warm up, the actual doing, and cool down. We all know that before we go out to a stage, before we enter a party, before we enter a playing field, we do some kind of warm up. Sometimes it's physical, sometimes it's me uh, psychophysical, sometimes it's just mental, but we prepare. We cross the line, a temporal line, an actual line, into the field and time of performance. And then we're in a different world. If it's working for us properly, it flows. If my performance for you right now is working for me, I'm not aware of the time. I'm not aware of the people in the room here with me. I'm not aware of the camera so much. I'm, I'm just in the flow of it. That's what good performing is. It kind of it annihilates time for the time of the performance. The spectator, you know, you don't want a spectator looking at her watch. That means that the spectator is not in the flow with you. We want that to be annihilated. And then we finish. And when we finish, uh, we take a bow and the people applaud or what have you. We have a way of cooling down. We go to the dressing room. We take off our costumes. Or we wash our face. We have a glass of water. We do something to reintegrate ourselves into ordinary life. You see how this is parallel to the ritual process, the separation, the actual liminal phase, and then the reintegration, except 
in this aesthetic way or sportive way, we're all transporters. We're not really transformed. If we get transformed by the performance, if we play the role so often that we become the role, that it becomes something else again. It's said that Bela Lugosi, who was a great actor, but he had a Romanian accent, he played Dracula, and he played Dracula, was forced to play Dracula so often that he became the role of Dracula. He never uh, bit people in their necks, I don't think, I don't know, maybe, you can never tell, but he was absorbed into that role, it kind of dro drove him crazy. All right, then, but that's not the end of it. When we go home at night, when we take off our, uh, our, our, our wedding dress or our party dress, it's not over. Then there's the aftermath, which also has three phases. It has the critical response. Now, that critical response can be formal. It can be the sports writer writing about Sunday's uh, football game. It can be the reviewer saying how well, how well you did. But it can also, the critical response can also be your friend, a blog, an email, somebody's telling you something. It's very hard when you're dealing with friends because they'll basically say nice things and you've got to get them a few days later to say, okay, what did you really think? And that'll help you revise. And then there are archives. At a certain point, the, uh, the third phase, which is aftermath, the first phase is uh, pre-performance, proto-performance, the second phase is performance, and this third phase is aftermath, archives, where things get stored. Now in the days of digitization, everything gets stored. Our behavior gets stored. Our webcams get stored. They get archived. And our informal and formal behaviors get stored to be reused later on. And then finally, there are memories. Memories are a kind of personal archive. Now, the digital archive, the actual archive, is sometimes more reliable in terms of giving you the, the stuff that really happened. But the memories are also interesting because memories are kind of your own life cooking and re-preparing what you've done. This is delicious if we begin to trust our memories. And what happens when a memory contradicts an archive? What happens if you say, well, when I did that, I did such and such, and somebody says, no, 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 look, this is what you really did. Now, I wouldn't reject the, quote, lie of the memory. I would say, why is my memory telling me something different than what the archive tells me? What's the dialogue? What's the performative relationship between what the archive has recorded, which can, which can only be the shell, because we don't yet have a camera or something inside our mind, and the neuronic, uh, uh, neurological connection that generates my memory. So for me, there's no such thing as a, quote, lie and untruth. There are only relationships between versions of actual this ties us back to an earlier idea I talked about, about Maya and Leela, about the playfulness of our lives, about the fact that we live a life of creation and destruction of our actual social and aesthetic realities. So in all these things, I want you to really remember this long arc of performance from proto to performance to aftermath and the relations between them. And when we get finished and we go back to our memories, what do we remember about the training? What do we remember about the beginning? So we can, we can focus on the performance itself, which is what a product-oriented culture tells us to do, or we can really try to open and expand our, our critical analysis and our experiential memories.